Jethro, if you have any questions, concerns, let me know. Typically speaking, from the past years, everyone, no one does very good on the midterm. So don't be super stressed about it. But it, of course, I will be very happy if you do great. So please try your best. Okay. Um, so, but you know, if you don't, don't, you know, don't, don't get depressed or anything because it's it's only a fraction of the grade. And my goal is for you to understand the concepts, not really to penalize you for an exam. I don't really care about exams so much. But please be aware of this. Um, and you know, uh, after them. And of course, you can reach out to him if you have any specific questions about examples and so on. And he will work out the problems in the class. So make sure you come to the review. Okay, so that will give you a good feeling for it. And it's useful to kind of think that through because that's kind of what you will try to apply in your drawings as well. So, do you have a question? Why, why do people typically not do well on the exam? You know, it's uh, the exam can be a little bit. How do I say it? Uh, Tricky. Not direct. Yeah. But you know, that, it's a, it's a, uh, what you think. That's the that's the idea. And for the exam, I should also point out that they, you know, the final answer is not the most critical thing. If you can show the path, that is correct in terms of the logical approach. And there are many approaches you saw in this drawing this year in, in, in Cambridge. Then you will get most of the points too. So just be aware of it. And also, in uh, I would say most years, no one ever finishes the exam in time. That's my experience. So just be aware of these things. Don't go nuts. You know, try your best. You know, I'm just giving you some upfront feedback. OK, so we need to uh, very quickly remember Thursday we have the assignment one, so make sure uh, all your team members are here, unless they haven't emailed me before. But I know a few are out of town, but just make sure. But your, let me point out, your team won't be penalized because someone else is here, but that person will be. Right? Because I have to grade individually. It's, not, it's a team effort. It's part of the effort. But, so make sure you talk to the team members. And I hope you have a meeting with them and, and trying to kind of work together. Because really, you need to start thinking carefully about it. Spending, you know, at least a couple hours a week, because that's how we'll make progress in the rest of the semester. So it's important to put in the time, I would say. And if you're having trouble, make sure you email me. I know some of you did. So. And, I'm, uh, and I'll, I'll try my best to, to help. So today, <clears throat> last week, we talked about uh, imaging optics. So geometrical optics is a, is a topic of imaging optics, right? How do you form images, like, like glasses we wear, Cam uh, lenses in your cameras and things like that. Today we're going to start a topic called non-imaging optics. Okay, and this is a bit of a long lecture, so we're going to divide it into two parts: part one and two. Okay? So, but all the notes are already posted, so you can welcome take a look at it. Okay. Yeah. So, are there any questions uh, if, uh, about non uh, the geometrical optics part? Okay. Guess not. So, you can go. Yes. <laughs> I don't need that, yes. OK, so the key differences between imaging and non-imaging optics. So we'll start with that. So fundamentally speaking, it's relatively simple to understand. So let's think about the review, OK? Because this is what you've seen for the last two lectures. In an imaging system, you know, let's think about the optics as a black box, OK? And that's the object. That's an image. Now, the image can be real or it can be uh, virtual. I think you can also saw some virtual images. In the case of a microscope, for instance, you typically form a virtual image because you want to magnify it like crazy. But you know, generally speaking, we'll talk about real images because for our case, when we're trying to collect some light and something, you want to have a real image. You want something to or, you know, be absorbed or an absorber or whatever. Right? So let's talk about that. So you have an object and an image. Now the key important metric uh, property of an image and object is that there is a one-to-one -one match. So one point, if you take a point on the object, let's say P, okay, there is a corresponding point P prime on the image. And and, and it's nothing else. So, so all the in the ideal system, all the rays from P need to end up at P prime. Okay, this is the most critical concept to keep in mind. Simple, but critical. So light 
from point P is captured by the optics and they may start to lose time. There is a unique one-to-one -one mapping between the points in P and P prime. Now in a real imaging optic, so, so uh, this is the ideal imaging optic. So that means if I pick another point here, there will be another point here, right? And so on and so forth. So there's a perfect, the image is a perfect replica of the object, one-to-one -one mapping. Now in a real system, of course, this is never true, right? Because no lens is perfect. Every lens, in other what that means is that, of course, the object can have perfect points because that's the object, right? Uh, but all the rays from this point may not end up here. It might end up a little bit blurred, right? This is referred to as diffraction blurring and, and chromatic aberrations and lens aberrations and all this stuff that you saw in your last lecture. Chapter Okay, so ideal system, real system. But in a real system, let's imagine, let's, let's imagine it's close to one to one, not perfect one to one, it's close in a, in a good instance. Okay. Like the camera in your, uh, the lens is in your phone, for instance. It's a pretty good system. It will do one to one. Right? You take a selfie, uh, you know, a point on your nose, there's one to a point on the image. Right? That's, the, that's the concept. Now, in a non-imaging system, this is no longer true. This can be true, but it generally doesn't have to be true. This is the key. So, in a non-imaging system, you have a light source, like the sun, let's say. You have some non-imaging optics, and you have a receiver, let's say a solar cell. Okay, or a hot water a solar absorber. Okay, and there is no one-to-one -one map. Generally speaking, it's a one-to-many map, or a many-to-one, many-to-many map. And we'll come to that later on. So that's the key again. So in non-imaging optics, the goal is to create a desired irradiance on the receiver from a given light source. So you want to do an energy transfer, not information transfer. Okay, just to uh, think about them differently. Image formation is an information transfer. You're forming the information out of a pit, right? The image right there. Whereas here, we're talking about energy transfer. Quite different. There is no one-to-one -one mapping of the points of the source to those of the signal. So again, if I pick a point here, there is no equivalent point here where all the rays from that point ended up. Okay? All the rays from that point can spread out over the entire receiver for all we know. Of course, there are some principles of design that we will talk about. But that is the simplest way to think about the difference, imaging and non-imaging. Okay. Obviously, this is not an image, right? Typically speaking, you don't form an image of the sun on the solar cell. You can. You'll come to it. But you don't, generally speaking. <clears throat> okay. Coming back to imaging systems, we can uh, envision them again in this, in this context. You have an object, optic, and image. So all the rays from F, okay, gets then uh, refracted by the lens here, CB, to a point A. The light from F is essentially concentrated onto A. Okay? Light from point P is concentrated to some point Q. Light from the point E is concentrated to some point D. Okay? There's immersion, as we know, because let's imagine it's a single lens. Another thing to keep in mind, of course, is we have, in an imaging optic, we have magnification, which means that this distance here, from the optical axis to the point P, is m times, or, 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 or this distance here, the, the distance of the image point Q from the optical axis is m times, magnification times, the distance of the object point from the optical axis. Or the di, the height of the image, is m times do. And, and that, that, of course, corresponds to the fact that there is a one-to-one -one map, right? So every point has an equivalent m times the original point. So you've seen this before. This is just imaging optic. In a non-imaging system, this is no longer true. But let's think a little bit more about imaging systems from the context of surfaces, okay? because we're going to apply this to non-imaging systems. So when we design imaging systems with lenses, which is what we've been talking about in the last two lectures, you know, if you take a single point here, P, and you want to define a surface here, okay, 
so this is an air, refractive index is one. Let's say this is in glass, refractive index of n or some plastic. This, these, all these rays need to come to the same point here. So how do you do it? You need to draw Snell's law at every ray, right? So Snell's law, we talked about it a couple, two lectures ago. So you take, let's take one ray going straight through, okay? You apply Snell's law at that point of inter intersection, right, between the air and the glass. Of course, because this is normally incident, you can say, oh, okay, it's the uh, angle of entry is zero, angle of refraction is zero, so it goes straight through. Okay. Now, if I take another ray here, I have to do the same thing. I have to apply Snell's law here, for, and I draw a normal here, then refract the light. I need to refract it such that I need to end up in the same point Q, right? So the way to think about this, so I'm going to draw it off the axis, and this is my desired image point. This is my object point. This ray is the straight line, so that's fine. So we will say, okay, that is the interface here, where the, it is essentially normal to the surface. And I'm going to draw another ray here. I know at that interface, the light needs to come this way, right? Oops. The light needs to come here. Okay. So at this point here, I have to apply Snell's law. The choice I have is I can draw the shape of the interface. Right? I can draw this line. Let me, let me draw that in a different color. So I can draw this line here such that if I draw a normal, um, this is not obviously correct. This is the incident angle, that is the refracted angle. Right? What I'm saying is that this uh, line I drew here, I can change that angle. Right? By changing that angle, I can bend this ray differently. So that's my design choice. By choosing that angle, I can force this to come to Q. And the same thing over here. So let's say I have another ray here. Now I take some other surface here. Oops. And I bend this way. So I can do that for every ray, right? Every ray. So there's an infinite number of rays coming through. I draw this. So in this case, I, I should end up with something which looks like that. Some concave surface. Okay, so every ray I can draw a tiny bit, an infinitesimal little line, and then draw them all together becomes a surface. Okay, in two D, in three dimension, becomes a surface. So that is the simplest way to think about designing a lens. Right, I'm applying Snell's law to every point on that lens. Now. Uh, there is a approach that's uh, incredibly tedious. We don't want to be doing that. There are simpler approaches. There's a principle called the Fermat's principle, which I think you also saw in one of the lectures before. But just uh, just to complete the, the, the discussion here, this surface is called a Cartesian oval. It's a surface such that each point on it has only one ray of light from P. Okay, so if I pick any point on the surface, I have a ray of light. So there's a unique ray. And the surface is chosen such that this ray then goes to Q. And it can, you can say that for every point on the surface. And that's how you define that lens. Now, as I said, you can apply Snell's law at every point on the surface, but that's a very tedious thing to do. There's a simpler way to think about it is what's called an optical path, optical path conservation. And it's also referred to as the Fermat's principle. It's a very important idea. And you will actually encounter it many times. Okay, in fact, in this lecture in particular, it basically says that the op if you want to form an image of a point, the optical path must be the same for all the rays from the object point to the image point. Now, the optical path is a little bit different than the real path. And the difference comes from the fact that light travels at different speeds in different media. In air, it has a speed of light, right? Three times something, 10 to the power of eight meters per second. If it's in a glass, you have to divide that speed by the refractive index. It slows down. We account for that. 
So for mass principle, we talk about optical path, but it really means the time of travel. That's why you need to define it, because you will see this later, that the distance divided by the velocity is the time of travel, right? So what I want to do is conserve the time of travel for all the rays. Not so important for, for, for you to understand at the moment, but when we talk about optical path, it's really time we're talking about. And this has very important implications in uh, uh, special relativity as well. We won't, of course, deal with that. But it's a very important concept, this idea of the mass principle, which can be applied in many, many fields. And what is it? It's very simple. From our, in this picture, it's very, very simple, right? It's simply, you add the distance the physical distance d, and you multiply it by the refractive index one, right? And you will see why that is, because this L is the physical distance, and this C is really the vacuum velocity of light divided by the refractive index, right? If I slow down, it's slower. If it's an air, air is one. So if I write this equation one more time, this is L over C, times n. Uh, C, let's call it C naught because that's the velocity of light in vacuum. It's constant, right? So you can just get rid of it. It's constant. Who cares? Right? So now we end up with this one. This is exactly for not for mass principle. L times n, or d times n. Right? So that that distance multiplied by the factor index corresponds to the time. Again, it's not so critical that you. Uh, appreciate the deep insights into this because it's, it, it is actually pretty involved. What's important is for us how we apply it. Okay, so let's think a little bit. So, okay, let's follow the ray. So let's follow this ray. It's simple. P to R is D times 1. So that's our D here. R to Q, that's what we want, right, is D1 times N. So D1 times N. Okay, so that's the path length of this ray. This path, right? P R Q. Let's follow another ray, right? I have three rays here. The other ray we have is the straight line. So this here to here is capital D times one. So you have that. Plus capital D one times n. We have that. That's the expression. This path length should be equal to this path. And it is true for all the rays. Once you make that true, then you can actually define the surface without really applying Slack's law. In fact, you can write that uh, math lab equation. You can write a simple algorithm and plot out those things. Okay. It's not that hard. Of course, in three dimensions, it becomes a little tricky, but you can do it. And that defines the surface. This is identical, and you can prove this if you want. It's identical to applying Slack's law. I'll show you one other interesting thing to connect this with, which is refraction. Okay, so refraction we saw it's now slow before. Right? So let's say we have air, so we have glass. A ray of light comes in. What happens? Goes closer to the normal or away from the normal? And is n is greater than one. Closer or away? Closer to normal. Now, what does that really mean? It's slowing down, right? The light is slowing down, so it needs to maintain what's called the phase front. As this wave front is going through, it has to bend to this. Right? And you can actually prove this by count. Uh, wait, what is again? I lost my train of thought. Ah, yes, yeah. So, so let's imagine you want to go from a point A here to some point B here, right? And what you're trying to do is you're trying to minimize the time of travel. This is what for mass principle says. You want to minimize the time of travel. Okay? So how, lo how what's the time of travel from here to here? Uh, let's, let's, let me put some... Um, 
distinction. So let's call this L1 and let's call this L2. So distance is L1 divided by the speed of light in air. Right? That's the time. Okay? That's the time for light to travel from here to here. So let's call that T1. So the, the time to travel from here to here is L2 divided by C naught divided by N. Okay? So the total time is to be minimized, which means that L1 divided by C naught plus N times L2 divided by C naught, which is T1 plus T2, must be as small as possible. That's the idea. Now, if you actually do this, with, now we, we can write down you know, this, this distance is the same, H, then you can write down L1 is H divided by, let's see, uh, let's see for now, now. Z1, which is sine theta 1, so uh, let me see. L1 is so it will be h divided by cos of theta 1 c naught plus or cos h theta r over c naught and h and yeah, maybe I'm, I'm messing up some geometry here. It should, it should work out to be Snell's law, basically. So I, I'm not going to try to do it right now because I'll waste my time. But, but it, anyway, what I, what I meant to say was that if you work out the time it took for light to travel from one point to here, another point to here, and essentially try to minimize that time, which is what the last principle say, you will end up with Snell's law. That's what I meant to say. So this is the reason why it's like this. So, this is slower here, so the distance this has to travel has to be smaller, right? For the same phase plane. And another way to think about it, the wavelength of the light in this medium is shorter. Remember, we talked about energy and frequency and so on. The two things that happen, one is the speed of light is related to lambda times the frequency. Remember this? When we go into some other medium, like glass, which is C naught, this becomes lambda naught divided by S. This does not change. The frequency of the light does not change, right? You shine, you bring laser into a glass of water, the color is still green inside the water. Right? The color does not change. The wavelength actually does change. Now, of course, this is common sense because frequency is directly related to energy, right? This E is H times nu, right? Or nu equals E divided by H, and these are H is a constant. So if energy has not changed, the frequency has not changed. Again, uh, I, I don't mean to confuse you with all these, but Keep in mind that when light travels from one medium to another medium, you don't change its energy. I mean, we talked about it briefly, but you change its speed, which is why it bends, you change its wavelength. Okay? This will become important later on. So coming back to Fermat's principle, where we basically made the optical path length the same, this is the same as minimizing the time of travel, basically. Okay? And this leads to Snell's law and everything else as well. So one other thing we should I should point out here is this. If you have a single point that you're forming an image of, a P to a point Q, one surface is sufficient. You can actually show that this one surface can actually form a perfect image. All the rays, what does that mean? Perfect image means that all the rays from P will end up at Q. Nothing will escape and nothing will go somewhere else. However, most real objects are not one point. There are many, many points. So you need more surfaces. Okay? So this is an example of imaging two points. So let's say you have two points, F, E, and F. Okay? In order to form an image of F, 
at A and an image of E at B. We need not just this surface, which is our first Cartesian oval, we have to need another surface. Okay, so in this case, we end up with a con con uh, convex surface. Again, this is conceptual, I'm not defining the actual lens. But the key point is that to image two points, you need at least two surfaces. And the two surfaces can be designed to such a two points of image, F to A, A to E to B. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that if you look at any other point between E and F, okay, let's say that point, nominally, you will have an equivalent point here. Right? You will have a one to one point. But in a real imaging system, as I said before, because of aberration, that's not true anymore. That one point will actually be many points. It will be a little bit blurry. Okay. So the two image points, you can still form two perfect images, two object points, but anything more in between will be blurry. Okay. And this is an important concept because we're going to use this for non-imaging short -term. So the other points on the object will not be missed perfectly. For perfect imaging, one would need infinite surfaces. So if you had a large number of surfaces, you could use this. Which is another way to think about what is going on in the camera of your phone. If you open up your uh, the phone, look at all the cameras, you will see there are like six, seven, eight lenses. Why? Because of this rule. You need more and more surfaces in order to form better images. And of course, because we're human beings, we don't perceive any differences with seven or surfaces are sufficient to form a good enough image. Of course, it also does do a lot of post-processing to make it look good to us, to our brain. Okay. So for perfect imaging, one needs in infinite surfaces, but we don't need perfect imaging in real life, uh, or perfect control of the vacuum, as you finish my talk, it's not important to us. So, but real lens lenses, of course, form imperfect images or images with aberration, similar to what you saw in the last lecture. Now, if moving on to non-imaging uh, objects, what we want, of course, is a source, maybe sunlight, okay? Some sort of device, let's call it a lens for now, as a concentrator, and then a receiver, okay? So, looking at the previous example, where we had a point E forming an image B, point F forming an image A, you can think about them as the edge points of the source, right? The edges of the source. E and F are the extreme points of the source. Now, if you are able to take the extreme points of the source and form images on the extreme points of the observer, you can actually show that everything in between will also end up on the observer. This is what's called an edge ray principle. So let's try to visualize it. It's a very important idea, because this is the key concept in non-imaging. So, what I'm saying is, if you are able to form an image of this edge point on the edge of the receiver, okay, which is A, and this edge point of the source at this edge of the receiver, that's all I need to do if I'm doing non-imaging. Everything else in between, all these rays in between, they automatically end up between these two. They will not be a one-to-one -one map, but we don't care. We just want to do an energy transfer. So, just to reiterate, if the edge points E and F are imaged onto A and B respectively, that simple imaging object that we just saw last slide, then all the rays from the intermediate points must pass in between A and B. Okay, all these rays need to end up here. The lens then acts as a concentrator. Okay. A perfect image is not formed. Right? Only these two points are perfect, but in between, they're all blurred. So that still acts as a concentrator. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the points on the object and those on the receiver. This is, of course, a simpler design problem, because you only need to consider two points here. Right? The edge point. So of course, you don't use the lens as a concentrator for a variety of reasons, it's not very efficient, but we'll come to that. Now, we are interested in the sun primarily, which means it's very, very large and very, very far away. Okay? When we think about large things really far away, instead of edge points, we talk about edge rays. 
because light from the sun is more or less direct. Okay? They are parallel rays of light. So one edge of the sun essentially emits these rays. Okay, another edge of the sun emits these rays. All parallel to each other, but different angles. It's just because they're far away. That's another simpler way to think about it. So these parallel rays, you want to form an image at this edge point. And these parallel rays, or these are called edge rays, will form an image at this point. Okay. And we define what's called angular extent of the sun. And we'll talk more and more about this because when we design non-imaging optics, we have to define what's called an acceptance angle. How large of an angle can you actually collect the light from? So in this is a simple example. Parallel rays uh, D1 are focused onto A. Parallel rays D2 are focused onto B. All rays in between these two angles, these two extreme angles, will end up in between A and B, but need not be focused upon. So again, these rays end up here, but if I have slightly shallower rays, they will end up somewhere in between. That's all this is saying. This is the edge ray principle. So slightly more, but in angle space. Talking in angle space. This will become more real, real, uh, in a real application when we talk about the compound parabolic lens. So first, let's take a 30 seconds or so to think about what we have talked so far and see if there are any questions. So just to summarize before we jump into this. We talked about what an imaging optic is, which is a lens, right? It forms a one-to-one -one map. And the difference in a non-imaging optic is that it's not, it's not a one-to-one -one map. It's a one-to-many map or a many-to-many -many map. Okay. Information versus energy. And then we talked about the most fundamental principle in non-imaging optics, which is the edge ray principle. Okay? So to reiterate, all it says is that if I'm able to form images of the two edge points of my source, or the two extreme rays from the source, then everything else in between will automatically end up at the my receiver. Okay. So I only really need to consider the edge rays, which is what we will do. So it's not like designing a conventional lens, right? So if you're trying to design a lens like this, the ones you're wearing, right? You want to ensure that the rays that come in from, from weird angles still end up forming a good image on my retina, right? But what I'm saying in a non-imaging system, you don't have to do that. All you need to do is you need to worry only about the most extreme ray and the most extreme ray. Everything else in between is completely ignored. Another way to think about it. Okay? And it is fundamentally different, right? And, the, and this principle is applicable for all applications in your projects. Daylighting to water desalination to solar concentration. Okay, so let's jump into the compound parabolic concentrator. So the compound parabolic concentrator is sort of like a, a, an example, a quintessential example of a non-imaging optic. It's Simple to understand from basic geometry, but it has some very important principles that, that ties to thermodynamics. So that's why we talked a little bit in detail about it. Okay? And it's still very useful, as you will see. Okay? We refer to we will refer to this as a CPC, okay? compound parabolic concentrator. In short. So let's look at this uh, video quickly. I have to disconnect this for a second. So it shows you an example of what it is. I'm avoiding the difficulties associated with a multi element system? If so. Okay. Want to collect and concentrate divergent light while avoiding the difficulties associated with a multi element system? If so, compound parabolic concentrators, known as CPCs, may be the choice for you. So a CPC about. is a concentrator designed using a rotated parabolic shape. The wide end of the CPC collects divergent light, which is then reflected within the CPC and concentrated at the narrow output end. That's the wide end. CPCs right. are defined using an acceptance angle. 
which is the angular range in which a CPC can collect light. CPCs are ideal for any application that requires the condensing of divergent light sources and are commonly used for solar energy collection, wireless communication, and biomedical and defense research. Okay, that's it. So, uh, just so you, you're aware of it, we won't talk about it, but these are very commonly used in telecom systems where you have a whole bunch of fiber optics coming in and that needs to connect to another bunch of fiber optics going out. Uh, typically, people put arrays of CPCs like this. But you can see that it looked like a big piece of glass, or it can be plastic. It can also be hollow. It doesn't need to be filled like that. Yeah. And it's filled. It, it really undergoes total internal reflection. If it's hollow, we want to make it completely reflective. We'll talk about these things. But just in the examples, they're all uh, total internal reflective for obvious reasons, right? Because total internal reflection is 100% efficient. So you get very high efficiency. OK. So in order to understand what a CPC is, we'll start with the simplest <coughs> possible uh, problem, design problem. Okay. So imagine we have a radiation source okay, of rays coming in. So that's R2 is one extreme ray, R1 is another extreme ray. And this E1 here represents the entrance of our optic we want to design. Okay. The source is far away, so we don't, we don't, we don't see it, we only see it. And A, B is our receiver. Okay, so let's say that's our sort of bow or, or, or a global for up or whatever. Okay. Our design goal is to concentrate the incoming radiation, which is between these two rays, R1 and R2, all the angles in between, to the maximum possible extent with the highest efficiency possible. Is that it? Very cool, right? So in other words, we want to, from the edge ray principle, what do we want to do? We want to take this ray, and concentrate it onto this point. We want to take this ray and concentrate it on this point. And then we know that everything else in between will end up there. Right? That's what we just said about the edge ray. So that's what we want to do. And the simplest way to do it <coughs> is with just some mirrors. Right? So now I've rotated it 90 degrees. So we're looking at it now. So our receiver is here, AB. Okay. Our entrance aperture is here, P1, P1. And that's the array R1. Coming at an angle there. So all we did is we put a little mirror here, a little slice of mirror, such that the ray R1 ends up at it. Simple, right? And I have an equivalent symmetric mirror here, such that a ray on the, in the opposite direction will end up at B. I haven't drawn it. Pretty simple, right? Basically, all you're doing is taking R1, putting in a ray. R2 on the other end, putting it at B, and then everything else should go in between. That's the simplest possible thing. Okay? Exactly what we saw in like a box token. Right? Now let's think we have some design freedom here, right? That we can take this angle theta, how we put this mirror, right? We have some options here. So so our goal, design goal, was uh, not only to improve efficiency, but also to increase concentration. Right? We want to concentrate it as much as possible. So for maximum concentration, this beta, this angle, must be as small as possible, right? Which means that this angle needs to go flat. Why? Because this C1, V1 will increase when I can collect larger input aperture. That's how, you know, simple way to think about concentration. Remember, concentration, if we remind ourselves what concentration means, If you, and this is important because it will get complicated later on. So let's imagine we have some optical element. The concentration of, means that this is the input aperture, and this is the output aperture. Right? And this concentration, simply, is the area of output, aperture, divided by area of input aperture. This is, we can, people also refer to this as a geometric concentration. So 
but in order to increase this concentration, I want to either make this smaller, right? And I input uh, uh, actually this height, this this height, the input because it's usually bigger than one. It depends upon how you talk about it. That's what goes in the box. So you can either make the output smaller, or you can make the in input bigger, right? To increase the pressure. So here. What that means is that you want to make the entrance aperture C1, D1 must be as large as possible. Let's say our receiver size is fixed, okay, it's whatever the work done on the box. Okay, our solar cooker that we need that. So only thing we, we can try to do is increase that size, C1, D1, to increase the concentration. But if we naively simply take this mirror and bend this down, can you tell me what happens? Actually, this is a good question. Applying the law of reflection. I want all, everyone to think about it and you can discuss. After 30 seconds or so. Force push the point in this way. I'll tell you the question again, but, but uh, I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> so I have this particular situation here, okay? Imagine what happens if beta decreases. Because that's what I want to do. I want to increase the entrance aperture, right? And the way to increase the entrance aperture is to bend this down a little bit. What happens? Don't shout the answer, just discuss. Simply apply law of reflection. That's all. And I will draw it over here. Oh. How do we do that? So let's see, I have a receiver. This is a D. I'm going to draw, I'm just going to draw one line. The question I'm asking is what happens if I do that? Right? Can you see? Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Anyway. Well, uh, you know. If, if you're like me, you can't, it's not easy for me to visualize these things. You draw, right? You draw it. So if I, if I bend this down to draw, my normal here, what happened? I reduce my angle of incidence. Yeah? So that means my angle of reflection also has to reduce. I right? love reflection, no? So I have to draw. So instead of going down to the receiver, it went up. What does that mean? I lost that energy. Okay? That's important because this is, for example, what we think about acceptance, this is exactly what acceptance is. Okay? So this system has an acceptance angle defined by this data. This system has an acceptance angle that's smaller than that. Okay, that's what that's telling me. We'll come back to that, but that's the way to think about it. Uh, so, which is what's shown here. Okay. So, the, my my bad drawing of this this the beta is too small. The light reflects out. It might get the other mirror and get leave the system. It get lost. The beta is too small. The edge ray alone will miss the receiver. So then let's think. Uh, take another thirty seconds. Let's see. What would you do? to avoid this problem, and you still want to increase the aperture. Yeah, if you've read the lecture notes, you know the answer. So <laughs> you didn't see it. OK, that's very good. Yes, you did. But, but let's think. Everyone think about 30 seconds. It's a good design problem, no? Simple, common sense. What would you do? I, w I wouldn't say it's simple. I mean, not obvious. Think 
about how we were designing that hydration over. We were trying to bend the light, remember, as we wanted. Yeah. Exactly the same thing here. We want to bend the light as we wanted. We want to bend it back instead of it leaving the system. But here, instead of refraction, we're going to do reflection. Okay? So one thing I can do is instead of bending this, I can add a mirror on top at a different angle such that the rays actually goes this way. Okay? Uh, this is not an obvious solution. So if it, does, it didn't apply, uh, come to you, it's okay. This didn't come to me either when I first learned this. Okay? So you would essentially, so that was the original mirror, you had another mirror. But at a slightly uh, smaller angle, beta 2. Uh, actually, larger angle, sorry. Makes it stand out. So here, now this way, these two rays are parallel to each other, so that's still the edge rays, right? You haven't changed the angle. Input angle is still the same. This way now ends up as before here. But this way now, if we had simply just reduced the angle here, this would have escaped. But because now we have a new mirror standing up, because we have not only changed the angle, but we also moved it up. This way is also coming to the front. Uh, that's what I mean by adjusting that angle to redirect the light. Kind of similar to what we were doing in the case of the uh, refractive light. So what have we done here? Now what's the what's the point? What we have done here is in, we have increased the incident input aperture. In, earlier it was C1, D1. Now it's C2, D2. Made it bigger. Right? So my numerator here is now bigger, so I have a higher concentration. My denominator is the same, I haven't changed it. So now I achieve a higher concentration without sacrificing any energy. That's the idea. Okay? Now we can keep going, right? We can ask, okay, I, I want to increase the concentration even more. Now my goal is to maximize the new entrance aperture, which is C2D2. Okay, I can keep going and keep doing this. Keep adding more mirrors, more and more mirrors. Of course, eventually, we end up with a continuous surface. Okay? And this is the parabola, and we'll see. Okay? So, so now, instead of a bunch of mirrors, you basically connect them all together, have a smooth curve. Okay? Curve uh, B, B3 and A, C3. So the way to think about it, you know, all these rays are parallel. Those are the edge rays. They all come to focus. Okay, so we, we will see this curve here actually is extended down here. Imagine it's actually a parabola if you ignore everything else. And there's a parabola with a focus at the end. Of course, it's tilted, so it's kind of hard to see. But we'll visualize it shortly. And of course, on the other side, you have an exact symmetric curve, right? You have the bendy things are mirror symmetric. The thing is cross section is symmetric. Same thing on the other side. Okay? So that's the intuitive way to think about how to draw the thing. <clears throat> so, uh, of course, similarly, you can keep adding mirrors, and these mirrors can be infinitesimally small. So, if you get tiny, tiny mirrors, add them all up, you get a nice continuous curve. And it's a reflective surface. So this is now all perfectly reflective. It, it can be total internal reflection, right? So they design that these angles are larger than the critical angle, and the higher index material than this, then it's the total internal reflection, which is what we saw in that video. Okay. But it doesn't have to be. It can just be a reflective surface. It can be air. You might want to do that, then you care about the weight, right? Otherwise, if you fill it with stuff, it'll be heavy. If you want very lightweight, you just make it reflective and you live with the losses involved there. No reflection is 100% efficient unless it's total internal reflection. Okay, you saw that in the last lecture. So, key things to keep in mind note the symmetry about the vertical axis as I said before. 
Uh, the angle beta, now we can think about this as a tangent, right? If we take a point here, let's say this right here, we can draw a tangent here and that defines this angle beta, okay? Which is this, which is angle of the tangent with respect to uh, the horizontal. This is the angle beta as we minimize at each point of the curve and you can write down a simple algebraic equation in the calculus to actually minimize the beta. You'll end up with a solution that gives you a parabola. That's how, you know, if you're on a computer, that's what you would do. This is also the curve that produces the smallest beta and the largest entrance aperture C3, D3. So that's why we're studying the CPC. You, and we'll prove this again. The CPC is the most theoretically best concentrator that you can hope to design in two dimensions. So that's why it's a nice metric to think about. We'll come to that again. We can actually prove that from some of the models. Now, the next question is what happens, so I, I, we said here this is the largest entrance aperture C3, D3. What happens if we keep going? Why is that the largest? Why, why can't I keep increasing, putting more and more mirrors? Any thoughts? Yes, and then? Exactly, it starts shadowing, yeah. Oh, actually, that's in the next slide, so let me skip there for a second. Oh, no. <laughs> so, let me, so let's finish this. But you're right. I, I kind of jumped the gun. We keep going. At some point, it's going to fill in, and then we'll start shadowing very loosely. So, there is a, so in other words, there is an optimum height of the CPC. And that is all determined by the acceptance angle, this theta here, the angle of this theta. We'll see this. It's very simple uh, 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 concepts. I mean, simple equations, but the concepts are important. So just to understand the parabola again, if we take this surface, this surface, and simply rotate it like this, okay, in a clockwise direction, such that the focus is now standing up, we get a plot which looks like that. Okay, so that's our CPC surface. Okay, and earlier the receiver was here, so everything is 90 degree rotated, right? So this is our receiver now. We cut this part off, so it's a three differentiated parabola. Now turn this back in, it becomes a full parabola. So this is exactly what we saw before. We have parallel rays coming in, going to a focal center. So these are our edge rays, that's the edge of the receiver. Now, this is also an interesting point to keep in mind. This follows Fermat's principle as well, our famous Fermat's principle. In other words, the optical path length from this plane, this line right there, because all these are plane waves, right? These are parallel waves. Q1, T1, F, is equal to Q2, T2, F, is equal to Q2, T2, F. This is all air. Let's assume. So I don't need to multiply by one. I just need to multiply by one. So the optical path lengths are all the same. In other words, Q1, Q1F is equal to Q2, Q2F, Q3, Q3F. It's the same as the for mass principle as before. Before, of course, there are two different materials. Here, it's all there. So, um, the curve has to be a parabola. The parabola has its axis parallel to the edge rays. So that's the axis of the parabola. It's always parallel to the edge rays. In the previous diagram, it was rotated by theta. Uh, not 90 degrees, but it's theta. By the acceptance, that's how much it's rotated. And to fully visualize it, this is the picture to keep in mind. So that's our nice CPC. That's one side. That's the other side. Uh, it's a little uh, busy, but if you keep this picture, it's a parabola, okay? And its focus is this point. So all the rays will focus the edge rays and focus this point. Okay? And then on the other side, we simply have a mirror reflection. So a few things to uh, keep in mind. There's a lot of stuff here, so let me point out a few important things. First of all, we call these truncated parabola because they remove a portion of it, right? 
The important things, of course, are the receiver. So that's the size of the receiver. That's our opening. Okay. And then that's our input, right? P1 is my input aperture. So my concentration now is V1 over V2. Okay, assuming V1 is area. Yes? Um, can you stack these two PCs so Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You answer it for me. I actually, wait a few slides and see if you can answer it. We're not quite there. We need to talk about accepting panels. It's a good question. Yeah. So the concentration is V1 over V2. Uh, and the, of course, the other important parameter is the acceptance angle. This is a full acceptance angle, so it's a cone of light that you provide. Generally speaking, we talk about the half angle. Okay, that's the that's the that's the edge ray, right? So it's a this way to end up there. Okay, and all the other parallel rays, if I come this way, they'll reflect off and end up here. Right, and the same thing happens on this direction. I have another edge ray ends up here. I have another parallel ray reflects off. And ends up here. One thing to keep in mind is what happens to the light once it gets out. The angles are all jumbled up, right? Why? Because it's not a plane, right? It's not a plane mirror. It's not going to preserve the input angle. That might give you a clue how to answer your question. So think about incoming rays are all within this nice cone, right? Our acceptance angle. Okay. Output, I cannot guarantee that. We haven't talked about the angle, so that's the only care about where they end up, the position. We can calculate it, but we haven't talked about it. We don't care, why? At the moment, we don't really care at what angle the light hits the absorber. In a solar cell, that's not true, we do care, but at the moment, we're not caring. Okay, so this picture is sort of important, and try, you know, it will take you a little bit of time to kind of digest it. So. Spend some time think, looking at it, thinking about it. Not complicated, but you know, it's a little bit visualization. So this is what uh, I had asked before. If we keep, keep extending the parabola, the curve inward and the entrance aperture decrease. So C4, D4 is actually less than C2, and shadow is not. So some of these light rays will get will block, will be blocked, right? So that's easy. So the edge ray principle here, just to reiterate so we understand the design principle, is the following. The light rays coming from the edges of the source must be deflected onto the edges of the receiver. Okay, this is the basic design principle of non emitting concentrators. And we know from before that all the rays in between will simply end up on the receiver in between somewhere. We don't care where, somewhere. Okay. So that's the edge ray with an in incoming angle of theta. Will end up at the edge of the receiver like this angle of theta. Okay, so that's the acceptance at half angle of the CPC. If I come in with an angle less than theta, which means it's within the acceptance cone, I will bounce off and end up at the receiver, like we said before. But if I come in with an angle greater than theta, then funny things can happen. It will bounce off, but eventually it will leave the system. Of course, these diagrams just drawn schematically. But the idea is that it will not end up at the receiver. So this is the definition of the acceptance angle. Within theta, everything ends up at the receiver. Outside theta, nothing ends up at the receiver. It's the ideal picture. So nothing is ideal. So all rays entering the CPC with the input angle less than theta are trapped and end up at the receiver, but all rays entering the CPC with the input angle greater than theta are locked. So now you can kind of think about what might happen if I put another CPC under here. Depends on the output angle coming up. So we can calculate it. I mean, people don't calculate it if they don't care about it, but you can calculate it. So whatever is within the acceptance angle of the bottom CPC will be correct. So if you can try to match the design, yes. You could make them all match. But you will what you will notice is that you cannot increase concentration. You cannot increase the 
uh, in geometric configuration with that losing energy. Because this CPC gives you the best possible energy. That comes from thermodynamics. So making, adding more CPCs is not necessarily that useful. Like if you just want a tall CPC, uh, you know, what you, that will change the concentration because you'll need a bigger aperture. Now, if you just want to pipe light, like in a daylighting situation, you will do a fiber, right? Because you don't particularly care. But you might have a CPC at the end of the fiber to collect as much light as possible, for instance. And that was the example of the video that we showed a couple of weeks ago. A light pipe is different than a light concentrator. Think, right? Light pipe is like a fiber. Concentrator is not only transferring, but also concentrating. That's the difference. It's a good question. So the acceptance of a CPC is simply the power or the number of rays reaching the receiver, or accepted rays, divided by the number of rays entering the CPC. And as we saw before, it's 100% if it's between minus theta and theta, which is what Kepler's law, or it's zero if it's outside that. Okay. And theta is the half of this. So this is the ideal case. So if I were to draw the diagram uh, of an acceptance, so this would be called acceptance, kind of like an efficiency, and this is theta. And this is my, uh, let's say, half acceptance angle. It will be 100% here, and then drop to zero. Right? The one the ideal CPC. In a real CPC, what you actually see is something like that. It also depends on whether it's 2D, 3D, and so on, because once you get to 3D, it gets much more complicated. Right? All those rays can have very funny angles. You do symmetric. What would happen if you put like a lens on top instead of having like a mirror? Kind of bend the light in with that note. Instead of a mirror? So, you know, you said if you put too many, you go past 90. Mm -hmm. What if you put a lens to help bend the light in? Yes, you can, but remember the lens itself will restrict the acceptance angle. Right. Okay, or in other words, well, let's, let's think about it. Let's draw that situation. I haven't thought about it, but let's. So, imagine this, you see. And you want to put a lens in front of it. Let's say a big lens. And what you're saying is that you want to form an image here? Because the lens is to form an image. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're thinking? Oh, you said that you could do uh, energy too with it, right? Yeah, yeah, but a lens will form an image. Okay. Right? So, so, so let's say you form the image here. Then the question really is, what is the angle of the rays coming out of that image? Because the CPC doesn't care. It's whatever the acceptance angle is, it will collect it. If it's outside, it won't collect it. So the lens, unfortunately, because if you imagine a, a, the sun is far away, what will it do? Right? It will take all the rays which are parallel, focus it to a point here. Right? And there's a small angular extent for the sun, right? Or something like half a degree. So it's have a small bend here. A small bend here, you form a tiny little image of the sun, focus on the sun, right? Because the sun is far away. And, and, but that's not utilizing the aperture of the CPC, you know, put everything here. But you know, your aperture is this big, you don't have any light out. Okay. So there's no reason to do it, you might as well just get rid of it and collect it. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now, there might be other configurations where you know you may want to control the angular extent coming out. I don't know. Yeah, it's possible. I haven't seen any, on any application like that. Not, not to discourage it, certainly think. <laughs> it's good to think all possibilities. Uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, just to reiterate the, the principle of uh, Fermat's principle for the parabola. So we saw the parabola, as I said, wrote down before, AC plus EF should be equal to GB plus EF. Okay. So that's our Fermat's principle. Now we're going to apply this to the CPC. This is an important concept, so let's try to go through it carefully. For the CPC, we have this edge right here, EBA. 
bit. <coughs> and then there's another red, C, B, red. So I'm, I'm going to hit with this red. Yeah, I'm going to hit this edge of this surface and flat straight across. But that's a that's a that's a marginal hit, like just barely about the receiver. That's in the direction. What, I, what for mass principle sake is, and also for the uh, for Vala, uh, this condition up here, is that if I if I uh, measure the optical path of this ray and this ray, it should be the same. Right? Remember, this is a parabola with a focal J, which is the same as this, right? So this ray is similar to this ray, this ray is similar to this ray, so we're just adding up the optical patterns. So you give us a very important result. So let's try to let's try to do it with this angle is correct. So we can say E B plus B A should be equal to C B plus B A. Okay, so I'm writing here C B plus A2. So let's see C B plus A2, which is this aperture here, should be equal to E B plus B A, that's B. Now C B is equal to B A, why? Because it's symmetric, right? C E B and B A are the same, so simply mirror symmetry. Okay, okay. This line and this line are the same. So I can write A2, so C B and B A can cancel out in this equation, right? Then I can write A2 is now equal to E B, so A2, is equal to e this equal to b, which is simply a1 times sine theta, because this is the 90 degree triangle, right? So the hypotenuse is a1. So sine theta times a1 is this equation. So now a very, very important result. a1 over a2 equals 1 over sine theta. So let's try to think about what this means and why is it important. First of all, a1 over a2 is what? Concentration. So now we have related the concentration to the acceptor's angle. On pure geometry, right? Nothing. It's just the principle of parabola. That's the only thing we have applied here. Nothing to do with no physics, basically. Now concentration is inversely proportional to sine of the acceptor's angle. It's a very, very important result. Let's think about that for a second. Which means, and this is ideal case, right? This is the best I can hope to do. If I want to concentrate more, I need to give up on the acceptance path. I can only accept a narrow slice. If I want to accept a large uh, range of angle, then I will have a limited amount of concentration. It's a very, very fundamental. We will we'll see that this also comes into dynamics. So the, so the way we derive this, by the way, I forgot to mention, this is the, what we're looking at is the optical path length between the wavefront CE. So this is a parallel wavefront CE coming from the sun, let's say. And the focus, so the distance from the parallel wavefront CE to the focus A, the same for all edge rays, the bending curve. Similar, similar to this idea here. Okay. Now let's try to apply this briefly. So uh, with some simple geometry, so coming back to the CPC, so we can define now the height. So the only other thing we need to know, so, so what did this tell us? This equation now told us, if I know my receiver size, my chain size, whatever, and if I know my in entrance aperture size, that defines my acceptor size. Or on the other hand, if I know my solar cell size, and I know my acceptor size, then I can define the these are my design parameters. One other thing that's missing is how tall is the CPC? Right? I don't quite know that yet. So that's what we're going to do in this slide. So in order to do that, simple geometry, we're going to define the uh, total height h is h1 plus h2. That is equal to h1, h2. And simple uh, trigonometry. So h1 is simply a1 over 2 divided by 10 theta because of this 90 degree triangle. A1 divided by two, 2 is that, 
tan theta is simply a1 divided by 2 divided by h1. Right? So you can see that term there. Plug that in, same thing on the other side, on the bottom, a2 over 2 over 2 theta. So h is simply a1 times 1 plus tan theta over 2 tan theta because I have written now a2 is simply a1 times tan theta in the last line. So, so now I have everything, right? For the CPC, all I need is A1. Uh, sorry, this is A2. A1. And H. And then the exception sign. So just four parameters, three of which are independent. If I know three, I can calculate the fourth one. So a couple of things in mind, as we know, a, a1 over a2 is the concentration is 1 over sine theta, right? And h, as we just saw, is simply, what did I say? a1, by the way, you don't, I forget to mention, you don't need to memorize anything. The exam is open book. I don't know if I mentioned that. It's open internet and all that. You just can't communicate with other people. I don't believe in memorizing things. So anyway, uh, the important thing to keep in mind here is that if I want, and let's think about the dependencies a little bit. If I want to increase my acceptance angle, okay, I want to increase theta. Uh, let me think. This should go down. This is wrong. <laughs> I need to correct that. So if theta increases, h goes down. Now, when you collect more light, the CPC gets water. No. So th this is a mistake, which is uh, uh, well updated. But as theta goes to zero, the, up the other direction, I will tell you to only capture a tiny slice of the light because I want to concentrate it like crazy. I want a huge concentration, right? One over side theta goes to infinity. I want to have huge concentration. H, H, H becomes very big. Very, very tall. It sort of uh, uh, should be also. Go ahead. Uh, I was wondering if it's just the small wider explosion on top of the last one is wider as well. Yes. So your concentration. Yeah. So remember, only three things are independent. So when you say smaller and wider, that means H is fixed and probably a one is fixed. Uh, and, and you probably have to pick a 2 and theta. So once you pick that, the other one is fixed. What, what I'm trying to say is that generally speaking, you don't, you don't care about what these things are unless you have some bone factor limitation. Typically, you are trying to do some acceptance angle. Someone gives you, okay, I want to accept 30 degrees. Right? And okay, I'll tell you, my receiver, my solar absorbers, Okay, one centimeter by one centimeter. Okay, and then the other two things can be design parameters. Okay, tell me what the most concentration you can hope to get. Design is CPC. That's a good exam question. Okay. There is no one answer. You can optimize. But generally speaking, if you want to do huge amounts of concentration, you will end up with very very tall CPC. Uh, it's another way to think about this, right? Because the CPC, when you say, when we say you want lots of concentration, that means this thing gets narrow and this thing gets wide. The only way to do that is to make this super tall, because otherwise it will start shadowing. And of course, that also means you're only collecting a tiny slice of the light, like only the parallel rays. Acceptance angle is very small. And the opposite is also true. So you'll get more uh, feeling for this as you try different examples. And we'll, we'll do some of those in the next lecture. So a CPC is an ideal concentrator in two dimensions. Uh, but it, once you go to three dimensions, then you have kind of many choices, right? You can do a, a CPC which looks like two intersection of two x and y CPCs, 
by can be simply a parallel or rotation. You can actually show that both of them are not ideal in, in figure one. It's close, it's close enough. In 3D, it can be shown that some of the skew rays, skew rays refer to light current coming in at weird angles, right? Because in three dimensions, you can have light coming at weird angles, but that breaks the symmetry, right? There's no longer any symmetry there. Uh, within the, some of the skew rays within the acceptance angle are lost, and some outside rays can get in, which is why I had that plot before, where you have this, what I have? This is the ideal case, but in a real case, you end up with something like that. So some of these are lost, some of these come in. So in a real system, when you want to do this, you people do it, use computers to optimize these things. So we'll, we'll stop here. And I just want to remind uh, a few things. Um, so presentation one instructions, so it's due on Thursday. Uh, you don't, you can submit to me a PowerPoint, a PDF, or something like that, it's fine for, for, for you. Uh, but of course you have to present it in class. Um, so it's a roughly 10 minutes, five minutes Q&A. So this is the first part, literature review, discuss pros, cons, between twists and technology solutions, identify the main problems. That's the assignment one. And I'm just giving your assignment two instructions now. I know it's a little bit early, but my time flies, so it's due October 18th, right after uh, fall break. So I start thinking about it. For, for assignment two, what we're really interested in is your brainstorming. So really, you know, you've got to do a brainstorming session. Think about all the potential solutions could be crazy, uh, be creative, or the problems that you've identified here, but be aware of it. And I'd like you to pick your top idea. It can be more than one, that's it. And describe it in a bit more detail. And that means you might want to do a little bit of analysis, you know, explain why this is novel, uh, what is the problem you're trying to solve. You know, go into a little more, more detail. And finally, present some preliminary calculations, which could be a tracing using the computer, can be just hand calculations. Uh, if you want to do simulations, perfection fine, but you don't have to. Uh, be as quantitative as you can, but you can leave the detailed technical analysis for the next assignment. But it's good to build up the foundation here, because otherwise you'll end up with not more work in the next one. Okay, so I'm just giving you, I, I'll try to give the instructions you know, at least a month ahead of time, so have time to think about this. Great question. Yeah. Uh, sorry. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm fairly good about responding to things. Even if I'm not around. I'm traveling a lot, so I apologize. But uh, usually in different time zones, so if I don't get back to you right away, that's the reason. Okay, I'll stop here. Thanks and good luck. I'm, a, I'm very excited to see your presentations. Usually, that, that's my favorite part, that you, you, you will come up with creative ideas. I hope.